Okay, so then although patents are often talked about in terms of innovation or as a kind of knowledge, as a kind of knowledge, they're primarily used in terms of competition for securing profit or for startups, at least securing venture capital. So this is quite different from how we normally think about it or hear about patents. These are about innovation. Actually, patents from the, from the company's perspective are a tool in, in terms of competition. So while they could be seen as in, in giving an incentive for innovation, actually they have more to do with survival. Businesses often use them as weapons, or talk about them as weapons. Um, and they, just like they talk about competition in terms of cutting somebody out, cutting them, or KO, uh, knocking them out, or killing them, all in quotation marks. And all of these things can be used either offensively or defensively. The strength of such weapons has less to do with the content of their technology, however, and more to do with its exclusivity. And this, I think, is where patents relate to secrecy. So the form is important, the exclusivity is important, and it's important because what matters is a relative advantage. The technology is not itself that important. What matters is that my technology is better than my competitors. And this goes back to Marx's uh, things on technology as well. So what makes a patent powerful is that it's not only a way to preserve a relative advantage, but because it's an open secret, rather than a secret that has to be kept secret, the company need not worry about including it openly in its products. So again, we can go back to Coke. If Coke's recipe was something that you could find out from the product itself by reverse engineering, it would have been gone years ago. And pro probably, in that case, Coke would have been much better off patenting it, because at least they would get 20 years of protection of keeping that open secret. The problem is that the secret is quite hard to figure out. Pepsi's tried, other people have tried, but it's quite hard to get exactly right. And that's, it's that nature of it that allows it not to need to be patented. So patents are valuable only because they're exclusive. Thus, while the patent regime is a nation-based one, when the Taiwanese government seeks to use IP to promote Taiwanese companies, it runs into a bit of a problem. This is because each Taiwanese company is linked, as I had talked about before, into alliances with different global companies. So if the Taiwanese government, or Gong Yuan was to license technology to all Taiwanese companies, the government would, in effect, be licensing it to the majority of the global industry, all at once. And, of course, uh, from Marx's discussion of technological improvements, we know that, essentially, if every company gains an advantage, it's just the same as if nobody had gained an advantage at all, except the price goes down. So to avoid this, the Taiwanese government had tends to pick first tier, second tier, and third tier companies, and gives the patent out the first year only to one company, the second year to a couple more, and the third year to more. So due to this exclusivity, it's difficult to assign a price to a patent, or even to a set of patents. And I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually skip that, I can go back to that again. Um, Okay, so basically by seeing the patent as a kind of knowledge meant for competition, a sort of secret valuable due to its exclusivity, this provides us another important perspective on what this kind of intellectual property actually is, and how it's very different from other sorts of IP like copyrights or trademarks, which, whose value actually is raised as they circulate. So patents are like secrets. If they circulate, their value goes down dramatically. Copyrights are quite different. If my book is only read by two or three people, it's probably not going to be that valuable. Okay, so then my last example, and I'm just going to go through this real quick, and if, if anybody has a question about it, we can talk about it later, um, is, is an example of, of a trade secret uh, court case. And this is between TSMC and SMIC, so TIGBN and uh, Johnson. Uh, so round one was in 2003. Uh, and this is basically when TSMC found out that, uh, that SMIC was using their technology. And so they filed a trade secret violation. SMIC is a Chinese company that's actually owned by a Taiwanese, uh, a Taiwanese CEO. Uh, so it's actually, at, at face value, it looks like this is Taiwan versus China. It's actually Taiwan versus Taiwan and China. Um, so it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So when SMIC started, one of the first things they did was try to attract as many TSMC employees as they could. And they, they focused on certain sp specific departments, on R&D, quality control, and technology transfer departments. And they hired away some 
something like 140 or 180 TSMC employees. Um, and so one of, one of the stories that comes in is that, is that TSMC was trying to uh, investigate to see if SMIC's products actually look at all like TSMC's, if they're violating patent. So the uh, chief general counsel of TSMC brought a chip to his R&D section and said, can you dissect this and tell me if it's anywhere near what we're doing? And the R&D people came back and said, you made a mistake. You gave me our chip. And he said, ah, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> so that's how the trade secret um, thing started. And it was settled in 2005 uh, for about $175 million. Oh, the other aspect of this that's important is that TSMC sued uh, SMIC in Taiwan first. And, and basically got an injunction that said SMIC could no longer hire TSMC employees until the trial is finished. Uh, of course, that verdict didn't mean anything at all because SMIC is in China, um, and Taiwan's <laughs> jurisdiction only extends to Taiwan. So this trade secret trial was in the United States. So this is Taiwan suing China in the United States for intellectual property. So the first settlement was for about 175 million uh, US dollars and it basically said that SMIC has to return all the important documents and if they return all the documents and no longer use that technology, then uh, they would get patents for the technology, uh, not patents, they would get licenses to the patents for that technology uh, for about six years, good for about six years. Um, okay. so, Basically, later on in 2005, TSMC decided that, that uh, Zhongxin wasn't following the agreement, and in 2005, they sued again. In 2009, the settlement, another settlement was reached, and this was after TSMC had asked the judge for about a billion U.S. dollars. Uh, instead, they were given 200 million U.S. dollars in the settlement. And part of the thing that analysts are talking about in this is, is why was the settlement so much less than it could have been? And this is what I'm going to end with, and I think this, this tells you a little bit more about this, about this situation in practice, is that basically what analysts are saying, and all of this is public information, none of this, um, I'm not doing field work with TSMC, so uh, all of this is from news articles. Um, so part of the reason they said is that China is a customer of TSMC, and this is a market that TSMC wants to go into. And, and Zhongxin Guoji actually happens to be invested in very heavily by the Chinese government. And so, by, by making the, the fine lower, TSMC is, in a sense, essence, sort of giving face to the Chinese government and saying, look, we want to work with you. And then the second very important reason is that if a $1 billion fine had been posed, SMIC would immediately go bankrupt and most likely would be bought out by this company. So this is TSMC, this is Tai Chi Dian, Lian Dian, and Zhongxin. So this company, this third ranking com company was already bought out by Global Foundries. This is actually now one company in third place. And chances are, as soon as SMIC went bankrupt, this company would buy them and would put TSMC immediately in a very difficult competitive situation. So TSMC now has a 10% ownership stake in the Chinese company um, and is trying to protect itself that way. So basically, as I go on with the project, I'm hoping that I can get more into participant observation, and, and I welcome any comments or questions. Or I hope it was clear. Thank you.